So hello and welcome everyone to our webinar today. The topic of today's webinar is Codeless Deep Learning with Sequential Data. My name is Katrin Melcher and I'm working as a data scientist in the evangelism team at NIME and I will run the first part of this webinar today. I'm here today together with Rosaria Silipo, who is going to show you some examples later on today and who is going to cover the second part of this webinar. In this webinar today, we want to show you what, um, what are special requirements for of sequential data and why you shouldn't use a standard feedforward neural network when it comes to sequential data and which kind of network architectures you can use instead and how you can implement these kind of architectures in NIME Analytics Platform by looking at three examples. Before we get started, a bit of housekeeping, please use our Q&A section to post your questions and also to upvote your favorite questions so that we can answer them either in the chat or afterwards also live. This session is recorded and will be available on YouTube afterwards. And after the event, we will send you a follow-up email with all the links and promotion codes and download information that we share throughout the session. Where can you ask questions or how can you ask questions? Here in the bottom of the Zoom toolbar, you have this Q&A button, then a new window will open and there you can type your questions. And with this, let's get started. And I would like to start by collecting some special requirements of sequential data so that we can find out why feedforward neural networks are maybe not the best idea. And one type of data which is often used when it comes to neural networks or sequential type of sequential data that is often used in neural networks is actually text. And text is just a sequence of either words or characters. Therefore, some sequential data. And I would like to collect these requirements of sequential data based on one example, where the task is to predict the next word in a sequence. And that's actually a kind of model we probably all use every day when we write an email and Google gives us recommendations which word we might want to use next in our email. And if I just tell you that the last word in the sequence is the, and I ask you, what is the next word in the sequence? then it's actually hard for you. It's a really hard task to find out is the next word tree, elephants, or hub. But actually, if I give you also some context information, like for example, the sentence was example workflows are available on the, then this task becomes much more solvable because then we probably all know that example workflows are available on the hub. And therefore, one of the requirements that we have is that a network that we use for sequential data must be able to take context, must be able to take context information into account. This means if the network makes some predictions, it shouldn't just look at the current state of our sequence, but it should take into account also information from the previous values in our sequence. In terms of text, this means taking into account previous words in our sequence. But actually just adding the context information saying, okay, these words were used before or these values occurred before in our sequence is not enough. Because what we see here is a bag of words. And with these words, which we have here, I can form two sentences with a completely different meaning. On one hand, I could form the sentence, the hotel was good, not bad at all. This made our vacation. And then probably the next word prediction would be fantastic. On the other hand, if I now just switch the words bad and good, then I end up with the sentence, the hotel was bad, not good at all. This made our vacation horrible, for example, could be the prediction. This means it's not enough to just have context information in general, but a neural network that we use for sequential modeling must be also able to take the word order into account, as this can be important with sequential data as well. This might not be super important for predicting the next word, especially if I give different words to choose out for of. But another example where um, of sequential analysis is actually sentiment analysis, where we want to find out the underlying sentiment, for example, for this hotel reviews. And here the word order becomes even more important. Another challenge that we have with sequential data is that we can have different sequence lengths. 
For example, in the example of what is the next word, in the beginning of my email, I have only two words, for example, hi, Susie. And later on in the email, I have more context information. And we actually don't want to limit our network to always just look at the last two words in our sequence. But if we have more information available, we want the network also to use this information. And therefore, another requirement that sequential data has is actually a network that we use for sequential modeling should be able to handle different sequence lengths so that we can make a prediction only based on two words, if we have only two words in our sequence. But if we have 12 words already available, we can take all these 12 words into account when predicting the next word. And the last challenge that we have is that information can be in different parts of our sequence. For example, the word yesterday, which encodes some time information, could be either in the beginning of our sequence, in the end of our sequence, or in the middle end of our sequence. And we want to be, we want a network that is able to recognize that yesterday is some time information, even though yesterday occurred, for example, in our training set always in the beginning of a sentence. This means we want to have a network that is position independent. So it recognizes that yesterday is some time information, no matter whether it occurs in the beginning, in the middle, or in the end of our sequence. If we now think of our feed forward neural network, how does it look like in a feed forward neural network? We always have an input layer with a fixed number of units. And then we have some weights, which are used to calculate the activation in the next layer. And then the next layer uses the activation from the previous layer and some other weights to calculate the activations in the next layer and so on. Important here in a feed forward neural network, we always have a fixed input size, which is the dimension of our input. We now think about how could we use it, this feed forward neural network for sequential data. Then I could think of two ways how I could say, okay, I have multiple inputs um, for the different elements in our sequence. And here I could say, okay, I can either encode whether a word is in the se input sequence or not by saying, okay, with the first input, I encode whether, for example, the word good is in our sequence or uh, with the second input, I encode whether the word bad is our, in our sequence. And in the, with the last one, I encode whether not is in our sequence. And the other option that comes to my, my mind is that I could also encode just the past values in this feed forward neural network. So I say here I have the input at time step one and here the input at time step two and so on. But actually both of these ideas, which I just presented, don't meet the requirements of sequential data, which we just discussed. Because with the first option where we encode whether a word is in the sequence or not with our input, there we don't take into account the word order, which was one of our requirements. On the other hand, if we go for the second example, for the second uh, suggestion, then we have here a fixed input size and we can't handle different sequence length anymore. And we also don't share any parameters and therefore we are not position invariant because if we have always in the beginning of our sentence the word or in the beginning of our sequence the word yesterday, then the weights corresponding to the first input, they learn that yesterday is some time information. But if yesterday occurs later on here in the end of the sequence, these weights didn't learn to extract in the information that yesterday is some time information. So we see a feed forward neural network doesn't meet these requirements which sequential data actually has. And the solution for this are so-called recurrent neural networks. So let's find out what are recurrent neural networks. And recurrent neural networks are a family of neural networks which are especially suitable for processing sequential data. And the key idea in recurrent neural networks is that we have a loop connection, and I will talk more about this loop connection throughout my next slides. And in the last years, RNNs, which is the short way of recurrent neural networks, uh, have been successfully used in many different tasks. For example, in the task which I used to collect all these requirements, which would be language modeling or text generation, but also for text classification, where, which is, for example, used for sentiment analysis, what I mentioned already as well, where we have reviews about a product, or about movies, um, or Twitter tweets, and we want to find out the underlying sentiment. In this case, the input would be some text. This means a sequence. And what we want to find out or what we want to predict is actually just one single value. 
But there are also examples where we have a sequence as input and a sequence as output, where we have, for example, neural machine translation, where I have a sentence in one sequence as input, and then I want to generate an output sequence with the translated text. Text summarization is another example where we have a long sequence as input and a shorter one as output. And then there are also examples where we have just one input and we want to generate a sequence, what would be, for example, image capture. But it don't always have to be text. It could be also some numerical values, for example, for demand prediction or stock price prediction. So let's start with something that we know already. Let's go back to our feed for a feed forward neural network and let's see how we can kind of change this feed forward neural network into a recurrent neural network. And therefore, I want to change a little bit how I represent a feed forward neural network. And I say, okay, instead of having two inputs, I combine my inputs into a vector, representing it just with one unit, and which produces an output. And I use here this box to represent my network. And then I make one more change because now my inputs come from the bottom and my produced output comes um, at the top. And now in case of sequential data, I have not only my input at the time step t equal to one, but I actually have inputs for each time step. So here each input could be one word. And what I do next is I just copy the static network and I apply it at each time step. This now doesn't meet our requirements yet because what we do is now we just apply the same network at each time step and we realize that that's actually not what we want to do because we want to add some context information. And to solve this issue, I will add one more thing, which is an additional hidden state, which now connects the different network copies. And therefore, if I am at a third time step, I have as input on one hand, my input at the third time step, and in addition, also a hidden state input. And I make my prediction based on the input at the third time step and this hidden state input. And in this hidden state input, I can memory can memorize a bit from my first input and from my second input. And this additional hidden state in state is often encoded with the letter H. And there are actually two ways how RNNs are often represented, either in this unrolled representation, which you saw already on my last slide, or in this rolled representation, which you can see here now on the left-hand side. And here we can now see this loop connection, which I mentioned already in the beginning, where we see, okay, we have here this loop, which kind of shows us that we always produce some output um, or the network always produces some output, which we use as input again. And I mentioned already the memory, and I would like to visualize this also a bit. Because what we see here, if we have only our first time step in the sequence, then we make our prediction only based on the information of the first time step. But later on, we kind of remember throughout this hidden state also always a bit from all the previous time steps. So here at the fourth time step, we don't make our prediction only based on the input of the fourth input in our sequence, but we have here in this hidden state a summary of all the other state of all the previous values, which we feed into this network as well. So we can now make the prediction based on the fourth time step, but taking into account also all the information that we saw before or the network saw before. And looking at this network, we can now think one more time about the four requirements I mentioned in the beginning. Does this network structure now actually meets all of these requirements? And remember the first one was that the network should take some context information into account. And as we make here our prediction, not only based on the fourth value in the sequence, we actually do take context information into account um, as we have this hidden state, which gives us a summary of everything that we saw before. The other requirement was that the network structure should take the order into account. And as we apply here um, a network at each time step, um, each one after the other, the hidden state here can also remember, remember things whether it saw the word not to change the meaning or not. And therefore, yes, we do take the order into account as well. Then another requirement was that the network should be able to handle different sequence lengths. And that's something that we do as well, because if we have just one input, then we just take one input to make our predictions. But if we have 
four input values in our sequence. Then we process all of these four inputs before we make the next prediction. And the last requirement that we had for sequential data was that it should be position independent. And as we are using here always at each time step, the same weights, and um, we are now also position independent because now it doesn't matter whether the word yesterday occurs here in the beginning or whether here as the fourth, fourth input because we always use the same weights which are trained to extract the information that yesterday is some time information. Now that we have an understanding or an idea how this RNNs um, work, let's have a quick look at the math behind an RNN where we look at an RNN with a really simple network structure, which is, has just one layer, which is the ton H layer here. And what happens here at each timestamp is that instead of taking just the weighted sum of our inputs and then apply the activation function ton H, what we do here is we have on one hand a weight matrix we take, which creates the uh, weighted sum of our inputs. And we add to this in addition also um, our, in, our hidden state multiplied with a weight matrix before we apply then the ton H activation function to calculate our activations at this time step, which in this case is also used as the hidden state output. But as you will see later, sometimes there are also more complicated network structures used here at each time step, which also produce different results for the output and for the hidden state that we feed into the next network copy. When it comes to topics like sentiment analysis, then we actually don't want to produce an output at each time step. But remember there we have a sequence as input, which is our text, and we might want to have as output the probability for this text having a positive um, sentiment. And therefore, there are different RNN architectures. One of these architectures is called many-to-many, -many, or the models are called sequence-to-sequence -sequence models. And in this case, we have a sequence as input, and we also have a sequence as target or as output. And there are actually two ways how we can then structure a many-to-many -many model. On one hand, we could have an example like the one here on the left-hand side, where whenever we have an input, we also produce right away an output. And the other option is that we first kind of process an input sequence before we start generating an output sequence. And what could be an example for these two kind of RNN architectures for the left-hand side architecture, where we want to produce an output right away whenever we have an input. An example is language modeling, where we can say, okay, we start with a star token and then we predict the first word. Once we have the first word, we feed this back into our network and we predict the next one and so on. And an example where we first want to process an input sequence and then we want to generate an output sequence is actually neural machine translation, where we have a sentence in a source language, uh, which we first process, where we have then here, for example, a dense representation of the context um, of the sentence. And this one is then used by another recurrent neural network um, to produce the translated sentence, which is then the target or the output sequence. The other option is instead of having many to many is many to one and one to many. And an example for many to one is for example, language classification where we want to find out in which language is a certain sentence or the same idea can be also used for sentiment analysis where we have here an input sequence and just after we processed all the sequence we actually want to create an output. And then an example for one to many is image captioning here we have just one input, the static image, and then the network learns to generate an output sequence describing what it can see on the image. The simple RNN structures, which I just showed you a few slides ago, where we have just one ton H layer, are actually sometimes too limited to be really useful. And for example, if I have this, um, use case of predicting the next word in the sequence, they might do a good job if you have only short-term dependencies like cars drive on the, then the network will be able to predict the next word as road. But if we have longer-term dependencies like I love the beach, my favorite sound is the crashing off, 
then the network might have forgotten about the beach already. And it is not sure whether it should predict the crashing of cars, the crashing of glass or crashing of waves. This means um, it just takes into account the most recent values in the sequence and not the one with longer term dependencies. And to overcome this problem, this problem, researchers came up with another network structure for this RNN unit, which is called long short term memory or LSTM unit for short. And here we can see now an image of an LSTM unit. And if you look at this LSTM unit, you see already that it's a bit more complicated. We have more than one layer here, but we see also a few other things. We see, for example, also that all these network copies are not connected just with one additional hidden state, but we have here now two additional hidden states. And this, hidden, this additional hidden state, which is here on the top, is often called cell state, which kind of summarizes just like a memory of this neural network of this RNN, which memorizes everything that it saw before. And then an LSTM unit in addition uses the idea of gates, where at each time step or at each step in the sequence, um, the network decides which information of the cell state of this memory state we actually want to forget which information we want to add to this memory state and which information from this memory state we want to output to make our prediction. And therefore it uses this concept of gates. Um, what is the idea of a gate? I would like to compare this to, the, to a garden gate. If you think about the different states that a garden gate can have, then a garden gate can be, for example, completely open. What would be actually the value one in our gate in, uh, in neural networks? And here we say, okay, all the information can just travel through this gate. A garden gate, on the other hand, can be also partially open. What would be a value in between zero and one where we let part of the information through? And the last state is that a gate can be also closed. What would be the value zero uh, where we say, okay, we don't let any information through. And in an LSTM or in gated units, um, a gate decides always for each dimension, whether it is open, partially open or closed. And a gate is then implemented via a sigmoid layer and a pointwise multiplication, where the task of the sigmoid layer is to produce a value between zero and one for each dimension in our state vector. And then we use this output from the sigmoid layer to multiply it pointwise to get our filtered state. I want to show this one more time in a visual way where we have here our cell state and we want to get our filtered cell state based on the information of our input X. Um, so what we would do is we will take a sigmoid layer which produces now for each dimension that we have in our cell state an output um, between zero and one encoding whether we want to keep this information or whether we want to delete it. And then what we would do, we would pointwise multiply um, the values with the cell state to get our filtered cell. And if we look at the LSTM unit structure, then we see actually three times that we have a sigmoid layer followed by a pointwise multiplication, which are these three gates, which I mentioned, just the forgot gate, which decides which, which information to delete, the input gate, which decides which information to add, and the output gate, which decides which information from our memory state do we want to um, output at this current state um, to make, for example, a prediction. This means the key behind LSTMs is that they have an additional cell state, which makes it easier to remember information, and at each step, so whenever we have an input, the LSTM performs always the same steps. First, based on the input, it decides which information is not relevant anymore and removes it from the cell state. Then there is an input gate where the LSTM unit decides which information should be added to this memory state. Then the cell state or the memory state is updated. And lastly, the LSTM unit decides which information is now important to make a prediction. Um, and this is the information which we then output and also feed into the next time step um, where it is used for all of these three gates. How can we implement an LSTM in Nyman Analytics platform? To do so, we have a special node, which is the LSTM layer node. 
And the LSTM layer node has three inputs, on one hand for the input tensors, and in the addition also two hidden, uh, two optional ports for the hidden state tensors. And these are these two um, states that we feed into each copy. If you want to kind of predefine them in a special way, then you can use these additional input ports to feed into the LSTM layer node um, the initial state tensors. Then in the configuration window, you can define the number of units, where the number of units is now corresponds to the size of the hidden state vector. This means the vector which we have here and the vector which we have here, and also um, the vector which are produced by these sigmoid layers. Another setting option allows you to return not only the last value, but actually also all the intermediate results, which is the setting here, return sequences. And if you are also interested in this salt state with the encoding the memory, then you can activate here this checkbox return state as well. For an LSTM unit, we then have as input, not just um, one single input, but we actually have a sequence. And therefore we also need to define a sequential input in our Keras input layer. And here at the input is then a tuple where the first value is the sequence length and the second value encodes the dimension of each value in our sequence. Um, and you can use the, the value questionnaire for the sequence length in case you want to be able to handle different sequence lengths. So for example, if you want to handle different sequences where each value in the sequence has 65 dimensions, you could define your input shape as questionnaire comma separated 65. And with this, I would like to hand over to Rosaria, who is going to talk about different RNN examples. Okay. So let's start the second part of uh, uh, this uh, webinar, and I'm going to show you some of the uh, examples for solutions using recurrent neural networks. The first one is going to be about the sentiment analysis. Catherine already talked a bit about that. Uh, sentiment analysis is a text classification problem. That means that we are supposed to assign a class, a text or a category, um, to assign a class to the text according to its content, to whatever the text contains. So uh, uh, an example for uh, text classification is language classification. We have a text and we are supposed to label it with the uh, language it's written in. Uh, another example for a text classification is a topic classification. For example, we have a bunch of uh, vacation reviews and we want to know if the vacation review is about uh, the hotel, the flight or the booking process. And then, of course, another classic example for text classification is the sentiment. The sentiment analysis, uh, if we apply, for example, to movie reviews, uh, takes a text, um, reads the text, and then extracts whether the text is positive or negative. Uh, for example, we have two uh, reviews here. The movie was really nice. The movie was terrible. One is a positive review, the other one is a negative review. So we want to teach a network to um, understand, to label each one of the sentences as a positive or a negative review. Um, as you have uh, heard before, um, recurrent neural networks are particularly useful when we, have, when we are dealing with text because text can be interpreted as a sequence of words and therefore uh, they fit the uh, recurrent character of the uh, LSTM network, for example. So we want to have an, a recurrent neural network. We want to feed the recurrent neural network with one word at a time. First the, then movie, then was, then really, then nice. And then after the last word, we want the network to output a probability uh, whether um, this uh, sentence was a positive sentence. Of course, if the, prob if the probability is too low, then the sentence can be interpreted as a negative sentence. So now let's see which problems we are dealing with. The first problem is the difference in sequence lengths. Uh, we have people write differently. So some of them, they have uh, um, 
Yeah, they write a lot of words, some of them they write very few words. On the other hand, training batches must contain sequences with the same length. So uh, at this point, uh, as a compromise, we choose a fixed sequence length and then we truncate the sequences that are too long or we zero pad the sequences that are too short. The second problem is the uh, words. So the networks understand numbers, they don't understand words. So how can I uh, transform my words into numbers? This process is called encoding. Uh, the most famous encoding is, of course, the one hot encoding because, you know, you take a vector, every cell of the vector corresponds to a word. If the word is present in the text, you have a one, otherwise you have a zero. Uh, the problem with the one hot encoding is that this vector can be very, very long because you need to have a place, a cell for each one of the words in the dictionary. If the dictionary contains 50,000 words, you have a vector with 50,000 words. It can be unmanageable. So for this particular problem of the sentiment analysis, we used uh, um, some kind of a compression strategy. Uh, first, we index encoded uh, the words. So that means that each word was associated with an index, with a number, uh, with a different number for each one of the word. Uh, and then uh, we um, applied an embedding layer to transform this index into a vector in the, in the embedding space. There are two uh, compression factors here. The first one is that uh, we associate each word with an index only for the most frequent words. So in this case, we have, let's say, a 50,000 word dictionary. We use only the top 20,000 words, the top most frequent 20,000 words, and the remaining words are just assigned the same default index. Um, and this one already reduces our dictionary size from 50,000 to 20,000 plus the one uh, with the default index. Um, then we, we take these um, index encoded words and we pass it through an embedding layer in the network. Uh, the embedding layer represents, has the goal of representing each word as a vector in the vector space, in the embedding space. So words with similar meaning end, end up having similar embedding vectors. And vectors that, uh, um, that have a very close semantic relationship uh, end up being um, also not very distant in the embedding space. So there is some kind, some uh, consistent representation in the, in the embedding space of the words in the dictionary, at least the ones that we have kept. Um, the immediate advantage of the embedding space is clear. I decide the size of the vector that represents the word, the word, and uh, it's not decided by the dictionary size. So uh, usually the embedding space has a few tens or a few hundreds of components uh, of dimensions, uh, while the one hot vector encoding has many thousands. So it's clear that uh, we have a lower dimension and the network is going to be smaller and uh, easier to handle. Um, also, you can train your own embeddings via the em an embedding layer, or there exist also pre-trained embeddings like uh, GLOW, and you can use those already prepared. So for our use case of the sentiment analysis, this is how it works. Here we have the, uh, the text. The text has been zero padded or truncated uh, to have a sequence length of 80 words. Uh, each word has been index encoded. That means that each word is represented by a number here. So for example, film is represented by the number 21. Notice that we represented, as I said before, only the top 20,000 words. Uh, the, mo the, the most infrequent words, the least frequent words have been represented by the same default index, which is in this case, the 20,001 here. I don't know if you see that here. Okay, and then uh, about the network, the network is going to accept a sequence of uh, indexes, the famous index encoding of the words, um, and then each uh, word is going to pass through the embedding layer, is going to be transformed into a vector in this embedding space, and then the vector is going to feed uh, the LSTM unit. And this, one is, this is going to happen at each uh, new uh, feeding of the network with a new word or index based, index encoded word. Um, when the uh, LSTM unit has finished processing all the words from the input sequence, then the final sigmoid, 
the final, um, sorry, one final unit with an activation uh, function as a sigmoid is going to produce the probability of this sentence to be positive. Notice that the sigmoid is used often when we have we need a score that is easy to interpret as a probability. So the sigmoid works well for that. And this is the workflow that we used. There is an input layer, there is a, an embedding layer, there is an LSTM layer, and then there is a dense layer. The dense layer is the famous one uh, neuron with the activation function, function sigmoid to, pro to produce the final probability of the sentence to be positive or negative. Let's see now the, um, the configuration dialogue. Um, here in the input layer, we have a sequence of 80 um, words, right, of 80 index encoded words. Um, then uh, in the embedding layer, we take this uh, sequence of 80 index encoded words. We um, start, we, we tell the embedding layer that we start from uh, a dictionary size in the input dimension of 20,002, which is the dictionary size, so the number of indexes we use plus one, and we want to end up in an, out, in an output dimension of 128. 128 is the dimension of the embedding space. This is something we decide. Um, and then after that, we have the LSTM layer. The LSTM layer takes a sequence of, um, uh, of vectors with, with 128 dimensions, and uh, the sequence has length 80. So this is described here in this input tensor here. And then re uh, remember, notice that the return sequences is not activated because in this case, we are not returning a sequence, but we are returning only one value for the probability. And so on. So this is uh, a relatively simple uh, network, uh, relatively easy to configure. It. Uh, the success rate, so the overall accuracy is around 83%. The coins kappa is, is 67%, so it's actually performing pretty well. We could, of course, optimize it, change the size of the embedding space, change the, uh, the number of states in the LSTM layer. So we could uh, use a longer sequence of words. So we could play a bit with some of the parameters to get maybe a few percent more. Now let's talk about time series prediction. Time series prediction, the idea here is uh, we want to predict the next value in a time series based on the previous past values. Um, it's a relatively common problem. It's used for demand prediction. For example, when I want to uh, predict the number of customers coming to the restaurant tonight based on the number of customers that came uh, until the last week. Um, uh, the stock price prediction is another one. The product price prediction, so this price prediction, I have the time series of prices, and then I want to predict the price tomorrow based on the prices in the previous days. Uh, for all this problem, we use an LSTM-based uh, network, uh, which has uh, uh, an, uh, some LSTM units here. And then since this time, we don't want to uh, produce a probability, but we want to produce a real number, an estimation for a real number, then we are going to use one uh, final layer with the ReLU activation function. The ReLU activation function is the one that is usually used to produce numbers. Um, time series prediction can be in two ways, can be univariate or multivariate. Univariate is when I want to predict the next value in the time series based on the previous values in the time, in the same time series. Multivariate is when I want to predict the next value in the time series under scrutiny using the past values of the same time ser series, but also some uh, also the past values of some other time series. So in this case, we would use the past values of the time series under scrutiny D, but also the past values of the time series F1, F2, F3, until Fn. The, it's a, the problem is similar anyway. So let's talk about univariate. Univariate, we have a, a one time series here. What we want to produce is this kind of training set where we have the target variable here and the past four values for each one of the target value here. So in the same row, we want to have the input sequence of past values and then the target, the current target value for this input sequence of past values. Right. So how do I go? How do I go from this uh, time series in one column to this uh, five column shaped uh, data table? So to do that, there is the leg column. The leg column is a node. It's a very simple node that takes one column. 
uh, copies it and then shifts it in time. It shifts it um, based on the values of the parameters leg and leg interval. Um, leg equal three means that I'm going to take three past values. Leg interval equal one or equal something means that I'm going to jump um, back in time um, the number of samples specified by leg interval. In this case, leg equal three and leg, leg interval equal one means that I'm going to use all the past values without any jumping, all the past three values. So if I have um, the current value x4, I'm going to uh, have also x3, x2, and x1. If I have x5, I'm going to have also x4, x3, and x2, and so on. So using the leg column, I can uh, shape my training data uh, with the sequence of past values and the current target value in the same row. The same leg column node can also be used in case of a multivariate time prediction, a uh, time series prediction, right? So I apply the same leg column to the uh, uh, the, the time series uh, to which the target belongs, but also to the other time series that I want to use for my um, uh, for my input. Um, the problem here is that instead of having just one vector of input features, I'm going to have a little matrix of input features. So how can I feed the input matrix into the Keras model? In this case, we are going to unroll it. We are going to take each row of this input matrix for each time step, and I'm, we are going to put it all in one vector. So we are going to get one vector composed of three parts, so of as many input features I have, and each part contains four steps uh, in the past uh, for it's the particular input feature. Um, so the only problem is that now we have to tell the Keras input layer that what it sees uh, at, the, uh, at the input is actually uh, a vector of this type. And then to tell him that it's a vector of this type, we have to give a size for three. For three means uh, three input features and four time steps for each one of them. And then when we use this uh, for three, then we uh, have this uh, input, input vector can be... Um, um, stored as a collection cell, and then uh, when we uh, input it into the Keras network layer uh, learner node, uh, we are going to use the option from collection to number double. Okay, so for this particular problem, uh, we had the London bike sharing um, data set from Kaggle. Um, it, the, the, this London, this uh, data set contains the number of bike shares per day plus um, a number of other um, features, like for example, weather features or calendar features. So, so we want to use all of them. Um, so the, 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 the goal is to predict the next uh, uh, number of bike shares uh, given the previous number of bike shares and the previous values for the weather features and the calendar features. Uh, this is the, um, the workflow that uh, we ended up using. This is, as before, the uh, network. The network has an input layer, an LSTM layer, and a dense layer. As you see, there is no embedding layer because we're not talking about text. And then notice one other thing, that instead of using the scorer node, like before, we use a numeric scorer. The numeric scorer calculates uh, some numerical error. This is because we are not in a classification problem, but we want to estimate the exact numbers in the future. Um, errors are hard to interpret. So to have a better idea of how well our model is performing, we are going to use a line plot are going to overlap the predicted time series with the original time series. So let's see how the model was performing. Um, we were uh, using, we were training the network for 50 epochs, um, and the training and the validation batch had size 32, and the optimizers, the selected optimizer was Adam. We were also shuffling the data before each epoch. So this is the, uh, those are the error measures. It, I mean, if you think a bit, it should be good because we have around 130 error on a, a, a range which is over the 1000, so it can't be that bad. But if we want to make sure, then we see the plot and we see that in the plot, the blue ones are the, predi is the predicted time series and the yellow one, the orange one, is the original time series. And you can see that the differences are actually not that much. Again, you can always play a bit with the parameters and you can get maybe uh, a, better, um, uh, a better estimation of the predicted values. 
Um, so the next, uh, uh, the last uh, solutions that I wanted to show you is the free text generation. This one is a bit uh, older. Uh, the, free, the free text generation wants to predict the next word or the next ca character based on the previous words or the previous characters. So now, do I choose the character or do I choose the word? If I choose the words, of course, it's uh, more accurate because I'm able to uh, model also the relationship among the words. If I choose, um, uh, however, this is more complicated because as we as we have seen before, uh, the dictionaries for for the words uh, is much is is huge, and then this uh, bring this um, leads to uh, more complicated networks, more uh, longer uh, calculation times, computational power, and so on and so on. The character level, of course, is smaller because the dictionary is smaller. You can have only uh, that many characters. Um, so the whole thing is much more manageable, but on the other side, you don't, cannot back in time that much to model all possible grammatical relationship among words. Usually a compromise is the subword level, for example, you can use syllables. Anyway, for this particular case, we used the, the character level. So we had uh, um, 100 character as the past uh, um, uh, as the sequence of past values of past characters and based on these 100 characters we wanted to predict the next character so even here this is the network we used an input layer then we had an lstm layer then we had a dropout layer for regularization only was removed later later and then we had a dense layer the dense layer again here was made of uh, um, units of as many units as the dictionary size and each unit had the uh, the task to represent the probability that this this character would be the next character um, that's why it was using the uh, soft, the the softmax uh, uh, sigmoid activation function the, uh, okay um, okay so this is the training net the workflow and then we had a deployment workflow the deployment workflow was using the previous the previously trained network to predict the next character so i triggered the network with 100 character i predict the 101 character then i feed back the 101 character i kick out the oldest character from the input sequence at the previous iteration I predict the 102 character. The 102nd character is fed back into the input sequence. The oldest character is also kicked out and so on and so on until I generate char character after character, the whole, a whole text. So we train this network once with rap songs, once with Shakespeare text and once with an Italian text. Uh, so this is to show that I can, depending on how I train the network, I can produce different speaking styles and different languages. This is what I obtained uh, after training the network with rap songs. This is what I obtained after training the network with Shakespearean text. And this is what I obtained after training the network with uh, the promise uh, in Italian. So, I mean, it's uh, close enough. Maybe sometimes the grammar doesn't make complete sense, but uh, it sounds Shakespearean or rapping or Italian. Um, thank you. And if there are questions now, we can uh, discuss them. Um, I think it refers to what you said at the beginning about independent of the yesterday, because the whole idea of uh, giving a time series to a network uh, is because you want to keep the time order. Yeah. Do you want to answer that? Mm -hmm. Just because the network is position independent and it has the same weights that we use at each time step. It doesn't mean that we don't take the time order into account because we do take this time order into account by having these different time steps connected with this hidden state. Um, so the network first processes the first time step, then the second one, then the third one, then the fourth one, and so on. Um, it's just that the network learns to extract the same information from all the time steps. I hope that makes sense. If not, Rosaria, feel free to comment as well. Yeah, so the position independent means that you can find things at different positions, but it, it, it doesn't mean that you just uh, can position things randomly. Of course, there is uh, um, an order that has, be, has to be respected in a time series. And then one more thing, um, the, this order is taken into account by the memory. So if, uh, um, I don't know, two words were together, that's going to be reflected in the memory of the LSTM units. 
I hope we answered that. Um, I can answer the one about the expert systems. Um, yeah, yes, please do so. Okay, so the, the, for the expert systems, it's, uh, uh, it's not exactly the same. So expert systems, uh, this whole thing is, a, is you know, it, it's still machine learning. So it, there is, of course, uh, some mathematics behind, but it's a different kind. So uh, I don't know which expert systems you are referring to, but I would say they're not the same. So neural networks are slightly, uh, so they have their own set of uh, uh, of rules, they are all based on uh, the on the gradient descent uh, procedure or some variant of the gradient descent procedure. Uh, they have they have it's it's a whole uh, subtopic of the machine learning, I would say. So it's it, it has something to do with the expert systems in the sense that, that there is some mathematics involved, yeah, and some uh, uh, estimation procedure, but uh, it's it's another kind of branch. Then we have a question from Tom Brown. Do these tools need GPU? If yes, what are some ways to get NIME set up with GPU? And to work with GPUs with a NIME, um, what you need is a Python environment where you have Keras GPU and TensorFlow GPU installed. There's actually a really nice way of doing so in NIME Analytics platform. If you go to the preferences, you can just say you want to create a Python environment or a Conda environment with GPU support. Um, and then you can train your network using GPU as well, in case you have a GPU. And otherwise, of course, you can also um, upload the workflow to some cloud service and train it there. And then there is another question. Can I use an optimizer node in time series using LSTMs? And yes, of course, you can retrain your network with different um, settings for the LSTM layer. For example, you can change the number of units that you use, but if you change something like the number of units, then you really have to start retraining your network um, always from scratch in each iteration of the optimization loop. And that can be quite time consuming um, to train different networks with different settings. And then... There was this question about classification that has, has disappeared. Um, I don't yeah, know why. I, so the question is, can I perform classification and use it with other multiple parameters to estimate how long before a task will be performed using times from previous tasks, ordering and performing times? Okay, so I, you think, would, I think what you would like to do is you have some input data where you know how long it took also um, before, but I don't see yet where the time comes in. I think he wants to estimate um, how long it's going to take for a task based on previous tasks he had. And it's going to be a classification problem because probably he wants to classify as long time, short time, medium time, something like that. Waiting times. Uh, yeah. So, so, of course, you can. If you have enough data, you can do it. And if that involves a uh, um, no, if, if that improves by knowing the past uh, uh, waiting times, sure, you can do that. The whole thing is to have a data set, I guess. A bit like the, the text generation. If you have a data set of rap songs, that's what comes out. I don't know. There is a question. The clinicians input free text. So could unlabeled data be used? That depends on the time. Exactly, to do what? Do yeah, no, I understand that it's unlabeled, but uh, I mean, with the unlabeled data, sure, if it's a task that you can do with unlabeled data, then you can use it. For example, the free text generation is, uh, is unlabeled data because you just have the text and you want to predict the next one in the text. But if you want to do a classification, then you need labels. Otherwise, it's not going to work. Like, for example, the sentiment analysis, you need uh, an examples with sentiments. Depends on what you want to do. You can do something with unlabeled data, sure. You cannot do uh, supervised tasks with unlabeled data, though. Then I think we can close here. I think so as well. Thank you again, everyone, for attending. And have a nice evening.